Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles and cousins, of course, and mops and pops, or if you prefer, grandmothers and grandfathers, and baseball fans everywhere. Welcome to this edition of the Valley Baseball League podcast. I'm going to do something I haven't done in any of these podcasts yet. I'm going to bring Joe Harmon in right off the top. And Joe, I think it's time that we let people in on exactly what we're doing here. Do you want to break it to him or you want me to break it to him? Uh, we're trying to decide whether we prefer moms and pops or grandmothers and grandfathers. No, no, no. I think we got to tell them <laughs> the backstory. So you the want me to go? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the truth is, at heart, I'm a hockey player. Right. And Joe bet me over a beer. I can't disclose what kind of beer it is because they're not sponsoring the show yet. But <laughs> if they yeah. sponsor us, I will let them on. Joe bet me that he, the baseball player, could teach me, the hockey player to understand baseball. Yeah, we're so not it, there yet. No, we're not. <laughs> and everyone in the league knows it. I've already joked on this podcast. I've been in board meetings where I'll say stuff like, um, hey, man, I can't believe they scored that many points. And somebody will come at me and say, uh, they score runs in baseball, not points. That's right. So, yeah. My, you know what? I said, hey, look, my hockey stick's bigger than your baseball bat, so let's go outside and see exactly what they score in baseball. So talk to people. I mean, do you think it's possible to teach a hockey player about baseball? Oh, I think it's absolutely possible. You know, uh, it's all about uh, just being a lover of sports and uh, having a good time on the field or the ice or wherever you happen to find yourself. And, you know, it's it is possible. Um, It's uh, baseball is a great game. It's easy to learn. You know, I think that it's a basic game. It's it's like playing tag on the playground where you have your base where you're safe and you can't be tag- you can't be tagged it or tagged out of the game. And baseball is three of those. Uh, you know, you're just you when you are let loose on the base pass, you're just playing tag, trying to trying to get from tagged out. And you're always just trying to get home. Um, and the rest of it is details. You know, the rest of it is just trying to figure out how the defense keeps the offense from scoring. So, well, that's also true in hockey. Hockey to me is a kind of a game of spatial relations. You know, you're kind of working, you know, as they say in soccer, you want to um, uh, play away from pressure. Hockey similar. You want to create an opening so that you can slip a puck through the net or through a couple of defensemen. To me, I got to be honest, I actually think baseball is the perfect game because it requires a complete set of skills. You have to be fast. You have to have good eye-hand coordination. You have to pay attention. I was recently at a PR presentation, and they said that the um, uh, attention span of the average adult was something like eight point something seconds, that a goldfish had a longer attention span. You know what? You can't play baseball if your attention span is 8.5 seconds, because if you sit in the outfield and you fall asleep or you're on first base oh, yeah. and you're not paying attention, guess what highlight reel you're going to make? Yeah, you know, we talk about that when we coach youth baseball a lot, when we just put, you know, the younger kids that come out and, uh, you know, they're in their first year or two, and, and they get put in the outfield, of course, because uh, that's where, you, you know, you got to stand out there and watch and learn. Uh, but they get bored and they start picking leaves and blowing on dandelions and because they think that they're not part of the game. Uh, but we have, and it's, it's a tough lesson to learn for a kid, but you really got to, you, just because you're out there, the ball might come at you any second and you've really got to keep your focus. Uh, and, uh, you know, and we, <laughs> you know, we, I, we joke as a uh, youth baseball coaches, you know, we see it happen all the time where, you know, kid a is out there, poking dandelions, kicking dandelions around, and then and misses his opportunity to make a big play because he was not paying attention. Um, it's well, a good point. You know what? Speaking of big plays, let's get into the big play for today. Yes. What's our and big play today? The big play for today is Sam Crawford, who uh, came out and won the game for the Charlottesville Tom Sox uh, this last year um, and took the league title. Strasburg batters certainly taking their time right now, stepping out of the plate after every single pitch, doing everything they can to disrupt Sam Crawford's rhythm that he's in out there. We're keeping our eyes on the radar as the storm nears closer and closer to Charlottesville. That one is hit deep by Cheney, giving Chase his edge, and he will leap to make the catch to put two away for the Express. The Tom Sox tasting victory here on the tip of their tongue as 
the number two hitter, Bryson Horn, comes up to bat with two away. And Sam Crawford, one out away from the BBL championship. You can feel the excitement here in Charlottesville. We've seen Seville Weekly Ballpark react to great plays, but we've never seen this sort of excitement for just a normal at bat. This place is going crazy right now. One of the biggest crowds we have had at Seville Weekly Ballpark really since the 4th of July game that's always packed as Crawford delivers. And that one is going to be hit hard down the left field line, going to fall foul into the parking lot as Horn falls behind 0-1. Crawford keeping his composure out there, getting set on the mound, going through his normal routine. Tom Sox dugout starting to overflow just a little bit as Crawford delivers. That one fouled once again, so an 0-2 hole as Horn gets some instruction from the Strasburg dugout to stop swinging and just wait for Crawford here. Two strikes, two outs on the board. Tom Sox Nation on their feet here at Seville Weekly Ballpark. He delivers, and that one is fouled once again. This is... The most excited we have seen Seva Weekly Ballpark. You can feel the excitement here, even from the press box. As Crawford gets set against Bryson Horn. Crawford winds up, delivers, and that ball just low for ball one. Disappointment here. The Tom Sox people right in front of us, extremely disappointed after that. So the count goes 1-2 for Horn as Crawford gets set. I'm not sure how you reward a batter. For not swinging 0 2 at a pitch that close to the Crawford strike zone. Lines up, delivers, and a swing and a miss. Charlottesville has another team of destiny. The Tom Sox are your 2019 BBL champions. They storm the mound. Seville, this one's for you. Uh, we managed to grab Dan Jaffe, who um, from Georgia Tech. So we got an inside, behind the scenes look at the Georgia Tech program, and we got a little bit of the backstory um, for Dan. Uh, the Georgia Tech, sh go ahead, tell them the secret about Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech is one of the premier baseball programs in the country and known as Catcher U because they produce so many big, big league catchers. Like, uh, well, probably the biggest name is Jason Veritek, came out of Georgia Tech. And so we're going to be talking to the catcher coach. Right on. So, Dan Jaffe. Get, yeah, and let's get right to it. Um, and now for Joe's magic trick. Watch this. Joe is going to do the fastest costume change anyone's ever seen. You ready? Wham! Thanks, Graham. And it is a real pleasure to be here with, uh, with you today. I am joined by assistant baseball coach for Georgia Tech, Dan Jaffe. Dan, thanks for being here with us. No, I appreciate you having me, Joe. Hey, uh, this is a fun fact, and I don't know if a lot of Valley Baseball League fans know this, but you are the guy that every Charlottesville Tom Sox fan has to thank for their BBL championship because you got Sam Crawford into this league. Hey, you know what? That 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 one's not on me. I'm going to give Jeff the credit no? on that. He, uh, he took a shot on Sammy, and we're just glad it paid off. You know, Charlottesville did a great job with him last year, and, you know, he came out and did an awesome job for us uh, for the 16 games we had in 2020. Yeah. Well, and, uh, you know, for those of that don't know, Sam Crawford won the championship game for the Charlottesville Tom Sox in uh, the finale of the 2019 season here in the VBL last year and uh, got his stats. Hopefully this doesn't mess up with uh, my video, but uh, he went five innings, five strikeouts in that championship game, pitched to a 2.51 ERA in that. And uh, what's life like on the field with Sam Crawford, Dan? Man, it, it, it's always interesting. Um, yeah. you know, I got to, I got to see this last summer, uh, when Sammy was up in Charlottesville, a couple videos that they decided to put together just of Sam's personality. Um, <laughs> you know, he's a goofy kid, but, uh, man, does he work hard? He gets the job done. Um, you know, shows up every day, thankful and excited to be there, uh, works extremely hard. And I mean, the kid's never given up and it just, it, it pays off for him. You know, Sammy, uh, when he comes into a game, he kind of commands the attention and commands the respect and because he knows he, he always plays with a chip on his shoulder that he's able to, uh, you know, come in and try to perform. And, you know, for 2020, he did a great job of it. And on top of it, you know, just he's able to be Sammy when uh, when the time comes, whether it's on the mound or in the dugout or at practice or wherever it might be. He, uh, yeah. he's, he's definitely the same guy that showed this last summer, it sounds like. Well, great. Well, we're definitely going to keep our eyes on him uh, and his career going forward. Now, you're a catcher, right? You're a catching instructor for, for the Yellow Jackets, is that correct? 
Yes, sir. All right. Now, and what's it like catching a guy like Sam? A guy that, that's, that's got that kind of energy and personality and command of the, and presence on the mound. So, uh, you know, for the most part, as a catcher myself, when I had to catch guys that were like Sammy, um, it was a lot of fun. But it was also extremely challenging because it, it can be unpredictable. It's explosive. Yeah. Um, you know, he's got a lot of intent in his mechanics and hides the ball well um, and really just lets it go and explodes a lot of high energy. So, you know, with, with high energy comes certain misses, whether it's mm. with a breaking ball or a fastball that goes a different place than you're expecting it. And, uh, you know, it kind of stayed true talking to our starting catcher from this last year, actually talking to our whole catching staff. Um, it, it, Sammy was one of the ones that it took a little bit to get used to, um, for really? everybody, just because yeah. the high energy, the intent, the, uh, you know, he hides the ball really well coming out of those mechanics that it, it makes it tough to catch, but it also with his stuff and with his energy and knowing what he's capable of doing, it, it also makes it a lot of fun. So let's not, uh, you know, this interview is about Dan Jaffe, uh, Sam Crawford stories all aside, Dan, tell us what's going on with Yellow Jackets ball here in 2020. How were things going before the lights got turned off? Uh, it, I mean, we were 11 of five. Um, Great. You know, yeah. it's, it was kind of sad. We, uh, the bus was loaded and mm. we were just finishing getting ready to get on the bus and head to uh, Tallahassee for a three game series with Florida state when, uh, we got the phone call saying, you know, sit tight. Uh, there's a meeting going on and, you know, we'll let you guys know. But, um, yeah, I mean, we were playing some really good ball before that. Uh, we had a really good weekend sweep of Ohio State at home. Um, tough series with Georgia, who just was a really good ball club that came out and did everything right against us. Um, and then opened up ACC play really well with a two out of three over uh, Virginia Tech. So, so you had a good looking season. Uh, you know, obviously the reasons behind the closure, we all understand are necessary and important and nobody questions them, but it's still, and it's particularly as a lifelong baseball guy, as you are, it's still got to hurt. It, it does. And, you know, obviously the closures were the right call. I mean, I don't think anybody can, can really argue that, especially with at the time. I mean, nobody really knew what we were dealing with. And I mean, frankly, to this day, it's still, you know, there's yeah. a bunch of different stories out there, but, um, I mean, it, it, regardless of what the reason would have been for a shutdown, it hurts. Whether it's yeah. right or wrong, it hurts. How are you uh, staying busy? Uh, right now, went back home to Las Vegas, see my family. Um, you know, see my family, see my girlfriend, be around uh, everybody back here. Um, doing a little work for my dad that uh, owns a law firm and just trying to be as involved with the Georgia Tech and baseball as we can be with the little that we do have going on. Um, you getting out, getting into the cage or playing a little catch or anything like that? Yeah. Try to play catch with whoever wants Whoever's to got a baseball ball. around. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. My son and I were in the backyard. Uh, you know, we got it. Luckily we have a tee and a little bit of space here in the yard that we could hit, but, uh, it's, you know, the, all the local fields are shut down, you know, and it's tough. Yeah, it's not easy. Yeah. So absolutely. So Dan mentioned you're from Vegas. How does a guy from Vegas end up in Atlanta? <laughs> you know, that one, it, it, it's a long story, but it's an interesting one. It's, it's, I mean, I'm kind of a perfect example of it's amazing how connections work. Yeah. Um, you know, when I left, I played at Villanova for uh, my freshman year in the fall of my sophomore year, transferred, went to the College of Southern Nevada in Las Vegas, which is a, just a national powerhouse junior college, um, played for Nick Garitano and Brian Gidge there. Uh, fast forward a little bit, went to Pacific University up in Oregon, graduated, played ball up there, graduated from up there and decided afterwards, instead of going to law school, um, that I wasn't ready to get off the baseball field. So I started coach, I came back home to Vegas, started coaching for the Las Vegas Baseball Academy, which mm -hmm. is a uh, youth organization here. Okay. Um, ended up getting hooked up with a guy named Berlin, Germany. That's actually his real name, believe it or not. <laughs> um, and he's actually one of the biggest mentors in my life right now. Um, started coaching with him with an elite high school scout team. Um, from there, CSN, Nick Garitano, Brian Gitch, who I played for, liked what I was doing as a coach, brought me on staff. Ended up, while coaching at CSN, we played a game against Cypress Junior College, which is coached by Scott Pickler, who coaches the Whitey Red Sox in the Cape Cod League. He liked me. Ended up coaching with Pick in the Cape. 
up at the Cape, I met Christian Wonders, who was our pitching coach and has now worked with the San Diego Padres. But at the time, he was uh, a uh, you know pitching instructor, um, or not an instructor. He was a uh, uh, consult for Georgia Tech okay. baseball and for Danny Hall. So then also ended up coaching Luke Waddell and Brant Herter, who played for Georgia Tech. And so when Danny Hall needed a catching coach, he was talking to Christian Wonders, and Christian dropped my name. Wow. Um, interviewed with Danny, and, and it, it all just kind of worked out. But, you know, it's amazing that if I didn't decide to come back and coach at LVBA, I wouldn't have met Berlin. If I didn't meet Berlin, wouldn't have gone to CSN, wouldn't have met Pick, wouldn't have met Christian, wouldn't have been at Georgia Tech. You know, it, it's amazing. just kind of – it's incredible how connections end up working out. Well, there is a lot of stuff to talk to and that's uh, talk about in that story. You picked out a couple of things from your bio that I read that I wanted to get to. Uh, you mentioned, uh, quote, the Cape, unquote, which uh, for those of our, our viewers who might not know, talking summer collegiate ball, you mean the Cape Cod League. Is that correct? correct. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, if from the Valley Baseball League to the Cape Cod League, you know, we look uh, we. Uh, try to think of ourselves as just as awesome as they are, but uh, that's quite a quite a place to be. Tell us about your experience up there. Um, a lot of the biggest entice with the Cape is the history. I mean, that goes with it. It's it's with how long it's been around, um, with the status that it's kind of held for a long time of having, you know, the the ultimately the top players in the country that end up there at some point in their careers. Um, on top of the I mean, just from being there, the scouting directors that are up there, the general managers that show up in the Cape and sit on a team for two weeks to go watch. Um, it, it's just kind of, it was an unbelievable experience and a lot of fun to be around those kinds of players. And that was really my first experiment um, in Division One caliber baseball. Uh, being at CSN, you know, it's a national powerhouse junior college um, that plays and could probably you know, compete at a very, very high level with some of these schools. But um, being at in the Cape, it really in the Cape Cod League, it really taught me the speed of the D1 game, having all those players up there um, from all these different schools. And it was just a really interesting introduction, and especially to see some of the players that, you know, at the next draft, you're hearing their name called very, very yeah. early on day one that, you know, you see why. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was just a great experience up there, man. Very historical that yeah, you see yeah. it in movies, you hear about it from all these players that it, uh, you know, it really makes an impression on you. No place to play baseball like the Cape. Uh, you know, I lived in Massachusetts for a number of years and would go to the beaches all the time. And I saw a game. Uh, the wind is always a factor, or at least it was the night I was there. Always. Always. Yeah. Uh, but beautiful fields, beautiful towns. Uh, did you, were you in, uh, what town were you in? I was in YD. I was in Yarmouth. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, Hyannis has good games up there. Uh, yep. Tro Does Truro have a team? Truro? No. Am I saying it right? No? No. All right. Anyway, so from the, from the Cape, uh, from there, you joined the San Diego Padres organization as a scout. Is that correct? Yeah. I, uh, after the Cape was done, I signed on to uh, be an associate scout with them in the Las Vegas area. And tell us about that. It was a lot of fun um, seeing a side of the game and learning about a side that I had never actually really thought of. Um, you know, I did my internship for my master's degree, um, doing a little bit of scouting stuff with uh, the Dodgers, essentially. But, uh, you know, signing on with the Padres after the Cape season was over, I talked to James Parker, who was the four corner area scout, and he just uh, liked what I had to say and talked to me about it and brought up the idea and said he needed some help in Vegas because it's such a booming baseball town with the yeah. collegiate level and all that. And then he also wanted to use me for, uh, to talk about the guys in the Cape, talk about my team, guys we played against, and, you know, just a little way to help out the Padres and, you know, kind of learn about another side of the game myself. Yeah. And as a scout, how do the summer leagues play into what, uh, that the scouting industry does? And, uh, you know, if you, if you, I take it, you didn't get to Virginia to scout the Valley League while you were working for the Padres, but uh, what is going through the minds of those scouts that are in the stands at our stadiums here up and down the Valley? So it's a couple different things, um, you know, especially for the guys that were just drafted, um, because obviously summer leagues are still going on 
you know, after the draft happens, and there are quite a few instances, especially ones that I saw in the Cape Cod League, that um, players get drafted. And then while they're negotiating those contracts, trying to, you know, whether it's get more money or teams try to figure out what to offer, they're watching those players. So, mm. you know, a lot of scouts that are in will be watching players they drafted if they're still playing. Um, and then the other one is just kind of prepping for the future two years. You know, it, it's taking note of names, seeing who's improving, seeing, uh, you know, who's kind of that next up and coming wave of, of players for that next year's draft. So, um, you know, like this summer, for example, scouts would be there getting ready for the 2021 draft, trying to see the next set of names and even taking taking note of certain guys for the 22 draft, um, kind of trying to start to prepare those boards. Just want to interrupt the conversation between Joe and Dan for just a quick second, long enough to remind you guys to subscribe, like, and share us, and also to ask you uh, to send your comments to us. You can put them on the comment page with YouTube. You can put them on the Facebook page for the Valley League. You can email them to us at vbleague at isomermedia.com. That's vbleague at isomermedia.com. All right, before we get back to the conversation, I do want to promote one of our star sponsors of the Valley Baseball League live streams, Grace Burroughs. Without Grace, we would not have been able to do the live streams these past two years. She was all signed up to sponsor this year. She even wrote a book. Imagine that. Um, she's got like 70 out there. So if you haven't read any of them, maybe this is the first one. Take a look. Got to thank Grace for everything she does. And as I said last night in the video podcast, last year um, we were promoting Grace by saying best-selling or New York Times best-selling author Grace Burroughs. If you can't find love on the baseball diamond, look no further than graceburrows.com. Hey, but if you're finding love on the baseball diamond in this pandemic, we want to hear from you. Here's that email address again, vbleague at uh, isomermedia.com, vbleague at isomermedia.com. Anyway, I, if that's the case, I know you have a story. All right, let's get back to baseball. Baseball, come on, focus, everybody. Here's Joe once again with Dan Jaffe from Catchers U. So then, Dan, uh, next step in your career, uh, you are a catching coach at Catcher U <laughs> at Georgia Tech. Yes, what sir. Did, uh, so when you were behind the plate in your own career as a player, did you, did you envision this? No. No, I, I, I still had uh, – when I was catching in my playing career, I, I knew I could play defense with the best of them, but I had this delusion that I could still hit. So I thought <laughs> I would end up, you know, having a shot, maybe getting to play professional baseball. But, uh, you know, if baseball was played in an elevator, I tell everybody, if baseball was played in an elevator shaft, I probably wouldn't be at Georgia Tech. I'd be, you know, trying to get ready to go play in the big leagues somewhere. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, it's not. Um, and it's amazing just kind of learning through the journey of coaching about hitting and how much better, you know, if I knew then what I know now about hitting, it was unbelievable how bad of a hitter I was having, that right? known, having known what I know now. Wow. Um, but yeah, no, as a player, I never envisioned, you know, being at a, a, a coach, being at Georgia Tech. Um, you know, this was something that after, once the career was over, the playing career was over, I just realized I wasn't ready to get off the field. I hear you. Hey, so tell me about being a catcher and coaching catchers. And I'll, I'll start this with a little anecdote. Uh, um, I always, even from when I was a little kid, I saw that the catchers were the hardest working guys in the field. 
But I'm a lefty, and uh, they don't make catcher gloves mitts for lefties. So I had to play first base. <laughs> it's ironic. You'd be surprised about that. Our pitching coach yeah. actually is a left-handed pitcher, uh, Danny Burrell. Yeah. And he uh, he actually catches every single one of his bullpens, and he has numerous left-handed catcher's mitts that Does he? he's able to find. Oh, yeah. It's kind of wow. funny. They're, they're funny looking, but they work. They don't, they don't sell them at Dick's. I've looked. No, um, they don't. <laughs> but so – uh, do you, what do you think? Uh, is it me or is the catchers the coolest guys out there? Oh, hundred percent. Best athletes on the diamond. Um, smartest, uh, smartest guys, obviously the best looking guys on the diamond because <laughs> you know, we, we have, we have to wear those masks because not everybody deserves to see the mask. <laughs> oh, no, that's a good one. I just that's figured I'd get one. in front of all the jokes that come out of this right off. All right. Yep. Yeah. Sweet, sweet. Yep. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, uh, let's say, uh, you know, obviously you're a coach, you're, you're a mentor to young players. Um, when you uh, meet, when you talk to say some younger players, some of the high school players, or even younger than that, that are coming up, what uh, what what overall overarching message do you have about the why the game is so important? That's a tough question. Yeah. Um, it it, it kind of changes. Um, it kind of changes player to player. Honestly, you know, it, it it depends on who you're talking to. It's really about knowing who you're talking to. Um, knowing about the personality, knowing about kind of their past and their history of how, you know, they got to where they're at, what they're trying to do in their future. Um, you know, so it, it, it kind of goes back and forth. You know, it, it, it doesn't exactly, it's not one fit, um, you know, one just index card fit for every um, player. Yeah. And now, Dan, at Georgia Tech, uh, I got to ask, what's it like working under and coaching under the legendary Danny Hall, the head coach at Georgia Tech? Oh, it, it, absolute Hall of Famer um, yeah. on the field, off the field, as a person. I mean, man, he, he, when I uh, was interviewing for this job, you know, obviously I did my research into Georgia Tech and into Coach Hall himself as well. Um, I, I couldn't find a person to say a bad word about Wow. Coach Hall, as far as players that play for him, um, coaches around, guys that know him, just and, and then it really shows um, the care he has for his players and staff and everybody around him as people first. You know, is just something you don't really see very often in this game, um, especially where wins and losses, you know, are, are truly the biggest indicator at our level of if you keep your job, frankly. Really, let alone anything else, but the care he has for his players, for his staff, the uh, power that he kind of instills in, in, in you know myself, James Ramsey, Dan, uh, Danny Burrell, and all of us that he he really just helps us out and guides us and really helps us get to that level. And you know it's kind of funny being in a dugout with with DH. He uh, just randomly will start being like, "Hey, you know he's going to bunt here, or yeah. uh, they're going to steal, or they're going to do this, or." You know, it, it's funny how many times he calls it, and it's like within the next two pitches that something like that happens. And then you, you kind of forget that he just finished his 27th year, and he's a full-blown Hall of Famer. Um, yeah. You know, won well over 1,500 games in his career and just has done it on a legendary level at a huge place. And, you know, it, it's just it's awesome to be around. And what I've learned just – watching him day in and day out is uh it's special you don't learn that just from anybody and dan just to wrap up uh, talking about your career uh you have a career as a player in a collegiate level uh, a scout for the san diego padres you're now an assistant coach for the georgia tech yellow jackets a high level division one uh team and program where do you see or want your career to go do you want to go toward do you want to stay a coach you want to go back into scouting uh where where do you hope to end up Oh, I want to say I want to say as a coach, man. There, yeah. There's there's nothing better in my opinion than the development than um, the you know aspect of trying to get these kids to realize their dreams and to really have you know a frontline hand on it to be able to help them achieve their goals and reach their dreams of professional baseball and that. And uh, on top of it, if you ask anybody that knows me, I'm probably way too overly competitive at literally anything I can find. You know, like I mean the shutdown. I'm, I'm commentating coin flips just because i need some sort of competition <laughs> um I, I i need i want to stay you know in the collegiate game and in the coaching ranks and you know hopefully climb to be a head coach one day here um 
because competition to me is everything and I think it brings out the best in you and I think it really helps um, with the aspect of development to helping these kids get to where they want to be, helping these young men achieve their dreams. Um, you know, without the competition aspect of it, there, there, it really minimizes our job on a different level. Yeah. So if one of the Valley, Valley Baseball League teams called you and looking for a head coach, would, uh, would you be into that? I mean, as much fun as it would be, it'd be a little difficult because I'm pretty sure with, uh, with the rules that I'm not allowed to coach. So, oh, okay. Because um, we're not allowed to coach our players, and the NCAA just has a lot of restrictions on it. So as much as I'd love to, I don't, I don't think that'd be – Right. Well, possible. we'll edit out that question. I apologize. I don't know the rules, all those detailed rules. But anyway, so let's let's segue this conversation back to the Valley Baseball League. And uh, we had talked a little bit earlier about your experience with the Cape Cod League, the premier summer collegiate wooden bat league. Um, when when you and your program at Georgia Tech look at sending players to summer leagues, uh, where where do you find that the Valley League fits into the plans? I mean, they're one of my first calls every Is single that right? Time. I mean, I, I look, I've only been doing this for two years um, with uh, summer placement. Um, when I came to Georgia Tech in January, uh, we realized around March and March or April that nobody had been placed anywhere. Um, you know, for I, I've sent three players last year to the Charlottesville Tom Sox. I had two more going this year. Um, I haven't, that's the only team I've really sent guys in the Valley League just because Jeff's been a great connection. Jeff Burton, he's been a great connection for me um, and, you know, always wants our guys. And it's, I, I've heard nothing but great things from our players that have been to Charlottesville. Um, you know, so they've been, it's been a great scenario um, to send guys there. But, you know, I'd love to get in with some of these other teams too because the Valley League is one of the top leagues around, you know, with without question. The opportunity mm -hmm. they can give on the field, um, little towns and little cities they're in, and everybody seems to love, um, and, and just the setups they've all had. On top of it, I mean, the baseball. I mean, you yeah. go look at the box scores, you go look at the rosters, you look at the people that end up in the Valley League and the schools that they're from, and it, it's high. Le it's as high-level baseball as you can find. You know, mm -hmm. so our, our guys that um, are, are the better players end up there, guys that we want to get reps against those better players and face the best of the best and be a part of a really good league to really challenge them. I mean, the Valley League is up there with the rest of them. There, there's yeah. no doubt about it. So we talked about Sam Crawford earlier. So Sam, uh, in addition to playing ball for the Charlottesville Tom Sox last summer in 19, he also took up an internship uh, as part of his experience playing in the VBL. You know, what, how does that play into uh, a player's decision and overall uh, development as a player and as a college athlete in the, in the general sense? Um, well, that was one of the things with Sammy. When he, uh, when he came in and talked to me, I wanted to play summer ball. You know, he told me how big his internship was to him um, and how big he, being able to um, combine his academics, which are through the roof, with his desire to play baseball. And he was telling me about, uh, you know, the internships that he liked in Charlottesville. And one of them specifically, that was one of his top ones. And, you know, forgive me right off the top of my head. I don't remember exactly what it was. And Sammy's way smarter than I am. So, you know, I'll let him explain that another day. But uh, yeah. that was one of the biggest, um, you know, enticements to for Sammy to go to play in Charlottesville was – that internship that was there as well, it, it's a career making type of internship for him. Um, and to couple it with the ability to pitch, you know, that's one of the reasons that the Valley League is so enticing is it gives those kind of players that are high academics and high athletics and still have the chance to do an internship and compete and do all those things that, you know, it's one of those leagues that makes it really possible. Um, yeah. Sammy's, Sammy's internship was unbelievable. He came back and he couldn't stop talking about it, how much he loved it and how much it meant to him. Um, Great. You know, so that that's when I when did. He I also mentioned pitching like in the that, championship game. Yeah, I got that text that night. <laughs> I got that. Oh, text good. From everybody that night. I saw the video and Sammy was fired up, um, you know, and pitching in situations like that prepped him for a lot of the situations he faced in 2020 for us. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Well, good. All right, Dan. So I thank you so much for joining us today. Before I let you go, I got to ask you this one question. Uh, are Georgia Tech guys so much better at playing because as, as a tech school, you're better at analytics? I mean, I, I will say one thing, man. We, we, the analytics that we're able to dive into, 
um, the access of, of certain things that we have and the intelligence that we have at this program is, uh, I mean, like it doesn't hurt. That's for sure. You know, we have an we have our analytics team. Um, you know, we have myself, James Ramsey, Danny Burrell that all dive straight into the analytics. And you know, Coach Hall is really getting into it big time as well. You know, he's really liking some of the stuff, and uh, you know, really is a big fan of that as well. And I think I think yeah, I think part of it is the uh, academics that we have the students that we have, the analytics team that we have really help make all that possible. And they teach the coaching staff what we're really looking at. Well, good. So, uh, yeah, I guess I can't deny that one. <laughs> all right. Well, Dan Jaffe, thank you a ton for joining us today. It's been a real joy. Dan Jaffe, assistant baseball coach and catcher instructor with Georgia Tech. And I uh, hope to see you again soon. When next time uh, you get a chance to come up to the Valley to catch a game, be sure to let us know. We'll get you a good seat. Absolutely, man. I can't wait and uh, appreciate you guys having me on. Take care. Have a good day. You too. All right. That's just about going to do it for us. Joe's going to join me in just a second as soon as he finishes changing back into his purple shirt and his purple t-shirt. So oh, look, he's all done. Harry's back. Joe. Yeah. Does it look purple? Because it's like this is like a burgundy t-shirt and a charcoal gray uh, golf shirt here. Polo right, shirt, well, so. It looks a little purple from here, but what do I know? Yeah, hey, man, just LED it, lighting. The LED lighting. And LED <laughs> lighting, it's purple. Hey, hit us up with uh, Sam Crawford. Yeah, let me check this out. Hey, did, what did you think of Jaff, uh, Dan Jaffe? Great guy, huh? Yeah, great guy. And, you know, one of the things I've kind of really come to enjoy is the sense of how people feel about the Valley League, kind of why they're sending players here, what they're hoping to get out. I know the league works extremely hard to kind of keep these pitchers healthy and to stick to the pitch counts. Um, Major League Baseball, it's a big push from them. And obviously we want these players to, you know, develop skills while we're here, yeah. but go back in one piece and be better for their experience here. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, great. And it's, great like, and it's like what uh, we heard from um, Eddie from LSU the other day, which was, you know, it's a fine line because – you want these players to go and get more experience and get better and, you know, learn. And, but at the same time, there's only so many pitches an arm has. So. Yeah. Well, what's wild is, so I, I hate to keep bringing up Roberto Hernandez, but oh, no. when, when he, yeah, well, when he was inducted into the um, front Royal hall of fame, you know, he was kind of lamenting about the day where you got the ball, you didn't give it up. You right. went, you know, you just went for it. And, uh, the, you know, those days for a good, you know, for good reasons are not here anymore. But it was yeah. interesting listening to a guy who'd been in a, th a thousand major league games talking about just getting the ball and not giving it back. Right. Um, hey, speaking different of time. different times. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, Phil, Sam. Yeah. So Sam Crawford, you know, the he was on the mound for the Charlottesville Top Sox when they won the championship game uh, back on August 7th of 2019. His stat line for that game, he got the decision, the win, five and a third innings pitch, no earned runs, only five hits, struck out five as well, no walks. And he had a really good year for the Top Sox overall, including the postseason. He had a 3.22 ERA. And a three and one record, three wins and a loss. All of his appearances, fifteen appearances, were all out of the bullpen, and he pitched a total of thirty-six and a third innings with forty-nine strikeouts. Wow! And yes, Mister Hockey Player, that's a lot of strikeouts over over thirty-six innings, forty-nine strikeouts. That's a good bit. Only and uh, thirteen walks, thirty-four hits. So really great stat line. Uh, we'll have to keep and keep his name. Uh, handy for when we're watching the MLB draft when he comes eligible. I'm not sure if he's eligible this year or not, but he's well. Guess, for. guess what? I got a little treat for our viewers. Oh, yeah? I've uh, got I've gotten Sam's number, and um, I uh, we're going to get him on the show in the not too distant future. That is fantastic. So, so uh, you know, part of teaching me baseball is me teaching you hockey. So <laughs> any ideas? Any idea how many hat tricks uh, 49 strikeouts would be? Yeah, uh, so that's what. Um, well, I'm, math is uh, not my strong suit here. So 49 divided by three is yeah, 16, one. 16, 16 hat tricks in 16 one goal. Hat -tricks, one, yeah. 16 hat tricks in a single. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right. Well, I hey, probably, man. I probably know more about hockey than you do about ball. But. <laughs> oh, ouch. All right. Uh, the fight. The fight will happen uh, right off the bat. 
when we come back at you tomorrow, we've got a great show for you tomorrow. Tomorrow, we're going to be bringing you um, our man, Brian O'Connor from UVA. Oh, that's, uh, that's great. Yeah. And then on Thursday, we're going to bring Sam Perlazzo. And a heads up on Friday, we were planning on starting our all-decade team discussion with John Leonard. He's the sports media relations director for the Valley Baseball League. But this just in, we're going to be talking to the pitching coach from Virginia Tech. Wow. John so, Leonard um, gets bumped. I love it. Well, <laughs> for the pitching coach. No, man. yeah. 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 So, all right. That's going to wrap it up for us. I want to close this out with a warm thank you to Joe Harmon for all his hard work uh, for the Valley League. And I want to wish you all on behalf of the league and the teams a uh, speedy return to the baseball diamond. Yes. And, of course, perfect health. We will see you all tomorrow night right here on the Valley Baseball League's video podcast channel. Stay Have healthy, everybody. Yep, stay healthy. We'll see you tomorrow night. Thanks for watching.